everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is Sarah from Artifactual Systems, and I'm really happy to be joined by uh, Dave and Natalie from um, Media Area. And we're going to be talking today about a project that we've been working on together to integrate uh, MediaConch into Archivematica. So first, Dave is going to give an introduction to MediaConch and what is this new tool and why does it exist and um, how does it relate to the Performa project, which is providing funding for this uh, tool and also for our integration. And then I'm going to follow up with um, a demonstration of what we've developed so far in, in Archivematica, so how it's going to work in Archivematica. And uh, we'll have time at the end for questions and uh, feedback, and we're also going to have some other feedback mechanisms for you to be able to contact us and say, you know, that those seemed like good ideas, but here's another idea or here's another way that I think I would use this tool within Archivematica particularly. Uh, so we'd be really, really interested in hearing from, from all of you about that. Um, so uh, now I will hand it over to Dave. Sure. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm Dave Rice. Um, I work on the Media Conch project along with Natalie Cadvernell and also Jerome Martinez and Ashley Bluer and uh, a number of other developers. Um, so <clears throat> the project is a component of the Proforma project, which is a European Commission funded project. And it's kind of based around this challenge to empower member institutions to gain full control over technical properties of digital content intended for long-term preservation. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I can say I see as a film preservationist originally um, in a school where we were taught like very comprehensive control over all aspects of film, like chemical, optical, um, mechanical, uh, everything. Um, but then I graduated and I worked with digital collection where I sort of understood what it felt like to have control over archival materials of formats that I was familiar with, but I was totally lost working with these digital materials. Um, so the Performa Challenge is really trying to help accelerate um, the creation of expertise and, and tools to um, enable those working in preservation to work, you know, to have the same level of control over digital content, although we're fairly new uh, as a profession working with digital content to like, you know, some of the analog formats we're more familiar with. Uh, the Performa project has um, three sub projects right now. Media Conch is one, uh, which is focused on two audiovisual formats, Matroska and FFV1. Uh, the other projects are focused on TIFF and uh, PDF. Uh, during, during our work, um, we ended up looking a lot at the Library of Congress sustainability factors in relation to Matroska and FFV1. Um, Matroska and FFV1 are both open, openly licensed formats, uh, so they get wide use in, in open video environments, uh, but they have not gone through a standardization process as, uh, for instance, like TIFF and PDF have, has. Um, so I'll talk a bit later about how in order to address more of the sustainability factors of these particular formats, we ended up um, you know, proposing and are now working in a open standards working group with the IETF to uh, further refine um, the specifications for Matroska and FFV1. Um, Media Conch as a project has uh, these kind of four components listed here. Uh, it's supposed to include like a metadata fixer, a policy checker, and an end checker. Um, the implementation checker is supposed to assess if a given set of files adheres to the standard properly or not. Um, so we were proposing uh, to participate in standardization of these formats further because the specifications as they were weren't refined enough to build a checker because they included a couple of contradictions, areas that were a little bit too vague. Um, so now, like for the working group, uh, it, it's sort of a lot easier to build an implementation checker because the uh, requirements of the implementation are a lot more clear. So I'd like to give an overview of these. Um, F51 is a lossless video encoding. It's, um, I mean, there are many lossless video encodings, um, like run length encoding and Huffia. Uh, there's some format do lossy and lossless, like H.264 and JPEG 2000. <clears throat> uh, FFV1 was originally created in 23. It was largely used as an intermediate format beforehand so that people could like process a video, save it to a file, process it some more, save it again without multiple saving uh, affecting generation loss. Um, 
So FFE1 kind of gradually became more and more investigated by those working in archives and preservation. So that uh, in the 2013 release of FFE1 version uh, 3, um, there were a number of archives kind of proposing different features, including multi-threading and uh, embedding checksums into the format. Um, so by the time the 2013 release happened, there ended up being a lot more archives ready to kind of invest and start using it. Uh, 2014 was the project, and 2016, actually it was like late 2015 is when uh, the formal standard is uh, started. Uh, FFE1 is, is uh, used in audiovisual uh, environments as a lossless codec uh, because it's kind of optimized for, for speed and size. So, I mean, just, you know, having experiences working lossless formats, like I can say FFE1, ends up being a bit more, uh, you know, convenient because things can kind of move around and process a lot faster than with some of the other formats. Um, some of the perks I normally go over with FF lossless, it's intended to, you know, store every sample of every plane, uh, every bit uh, losslessly so that if you have uncompressed video, you can store it in a space efficient way that doesn't create a ton of e-waste and then uh, recreate the original video signal from the compressed version. Um, there are a number of loss formats that include uh, fixity checks. Um, a lot of like archiving, um, like zip files and such, you know, incorporate fixity because uh, when you have a lossless file, the effect of a, a bit flip or sector loss is a bit more substantial. So, lo you know, lossless formats that are, you know, well behaved, you incorporate fixity elements into it. So FFE1 has checked itself so that it can itself tell if it has been damaged or changed since it was originally encoded. Uh, FFE1 also incorporates there's no room in the video encoding itself to say if it's like full range or broadcast range or what colors it's using. Um, in this case, like FFE1 can describe its its how its own technical characteristics very explicitly, which kind of makes it uh, a little safer than some of the other formats that don't from interoperability issues. And then size is, you know, certainly um, an obvious perk because you end up with about a third less data than uncompressed, so it's kind of faster to back up, faster to check some, um, you know, all the considerations of bandwidth and storage um, are reduced. So with the fix issue, I just want to uh, showcase this a bit. This is like an uncompressed file. Uh, that was uh, corrupted in storage uh, at a vendor. So you can see that like horizontal line in there. Uh, the uncompressed video, there's not really any internal mechanism for a computer to know that there is a, a piece of damage in the file. Uh, so you're, in this case, we were using uh, a frame checksumming process to compare the original uh, to a, a derivative to identify this. And this error happened about once every 40 gigabytes or so in the network environment that they were working in until this was identified and changed. <clears throat> so like uh, some damage to uncompressed will look like this. It's very linear and, and, and orderly, uh, but still it's a mark. Um, in uh, FFE1, the same, uh, same size of damage used to look like this, where you'd have this kind of like psychedelic rainbow pattern in one of the slices. <clears throat> so you kind of tell that with FFV1 here, the video is sliced into components that are encoded separately. Uh, this video happens to be encoded in six uh, slices, so it's the sixth one that's damaged. Uh, in early decoders of FFV1, it would just show the damaged data as is, uh, but it would label it. It would say that there's a mismatch. It would tell you what frame it's on, so it's very clear that there was some damage. Um, in more recent versions, the damage is still reported, reported, but it's concealed by using data from the prior valid slice. All right, so that's my introduction to FFE1 uh, for those who could keep up. Um, the other format we're talking about here is Matroska. This is a, a container format, so it's, um, it's a format in which you store audio, video, subtitle, attachments, metadata, you know, uh, time code, uh, you know, any, anything else that kind of acco uh, accommodates an audiovisual uh, presentation. <clears throat> so in the working group, we've been kind of focusing on the foundation of Matroska, which is called extensible binary meta language, which is a binary XML format. Uh, and that's used as the basis for uh, both Matroska and WebM, which is kind of like a Google variant of, of Matroska. 
Um, with eBML, you can kind of make an XML-like rendition of what a Matroska file is. Uh, so, you know, just like in, um, in XML, you have this kind of like hierarchical structure of labels and sizes and values. You can, Matroska is built the same way. <clears throat> so in, in the Matroska format, you, it's based on eBML. Uh, so you end up having Matroska defined in an eBML schema, kind of in the same way you have an XML document defined by an XML schema. Um, the same kind of analogy works for uh, validating the file format too. So as in the working group where Thurver defining um, the concept of an eBML schema, um, tools like MediaConch and MKV Validator are using the eBML schema to validate expressions of eBML documents of which Matroska is one type. Um, <clears throat> I should point out, like you can see in this example here, um, kind of in the info node, there's a node called CRC32. Um, eBML has a feature where every node can have an embedded uh, CRC that gives you a checksum of the data of the rest of the node. And this has been incorporated into FFmpeg recently so that any Matroska file written by FFmpeg has like all this internal fixity. So it ends up only being like 100 bytes or so that aren't protected by uh, internal fixity. Uh, this makes uh, Matroska a bit easier to work with in a preservation environment because if, if there is any change to it, you can identify like under what component the change had affected. Uh, and you can also change some parts of the file while maintaining um, the constancy of fixity data in other parts of the file. Yeah. <clears throat> so I just want to talk a little bit about the Seller Working Group. Um, the short version of its mission is to use the existing work done by the development communities of Matroska FFE1 and IETF added FLAC as well, uh, so that the working group will formalize specifications of the lossless and open formats. Um, so that's all happening through the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Um, so I just want to give a, a shout out to this, the seller working group, which is the IETF uh, working group that these formats are being worked on under. Um, so if you if you go there, you can see like the entire history of our email conversation. Um, you can see links to the GitHub repositories that we work in, and then all the kind of um, you know informational documents or working group documents that we've been creating so far. So I think um, earlier this week we put in a new version of the eBML specification. Um, yeah. So I mean, this is this is helping because it's a, you know a lot of. Um, Audiovisual open format are kind of defined by like specific communities. Um, but it's often like in an informal as needed nature. So it's great to work in this environment where these formats that have been developing as open formats are now going through an open standards organizations process and getting like fully vetted and having all these people kind of, you know, pick apart uh, the small details of the specifications to kind of, you know, make them more, more stable and reliable. All right, so here's my thanks slide because that concludes the format introduction side of things. Um, I just want to make sure that you guys, I'm going to transition to doing some media conch demos, but I just want to make sure you guys can hear me okay, and that the things I'm saying are tolerable. All right, Villarreal's happy, so it's good for me. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to try to share a screen now, um, and hope nothing embarrassing pops up. Uh, oh, wait, have I been sharing? You guys, this, Let's see. Sharing my screen, right? Do you guys see like the MediaCon application? Do, do, do. You saw the slides and now you're screen. Okay. I will try to keep this over here so I can still see your chat. <clears throat> All right. So on the MediaCon website, uh, I'm running the um, September release of MediaCon. There's, if you go to the MediaConch web, it links to, there's an online version of MediaConch, so you, you can test it without even installing anything. Um, it has like a number of example files already in the online version, so you can just test with the files that are already there. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk through a couple uh, parts of <clears throat> MediaConch. And then, Sarah, can you remind me what time I have to transition back to you? Because I just want to be well paced. Not Nothing too strict, but uh, like another 10 minutes or so. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay for me. Perfect. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, to go over the reporting section of MediaConch first, because it's, it's a bit the easiest. Um, 
there are two uh, technical reports incorporated in here. So if you drag in a file, it makes a row. Um, if you click on media info, you can see this, you know, a kind of traditional media info report. I think a lot of people are familiar with, with this tool already. Um, it gives the media info report in this kind of like nested, um, this is like a JSON viewer, but it's, it's searchable as well. So you can do it and it'll kind of highlight in terms for you. to match that term. So it's like normalizing a vocabulary across these technical parameters of a, like a wide variety of audiovisual formats. Um, the, the technical report in here that people aren't necessarily as familiar with is Media Trace. <clears throat> media Trace takes kind of an opposite, a different, a different perspective from Media Info. It, it tries to break down the file byte for byte and categorize what everything is. So you'll see a byte offset in the left column, and then it'll the component. So like this is a matrosa file. It starts with an EBML header. So I can see there's a, a document conversion to the segment section, which is kind of the main body of a matroska document. So uh, if I go into here, I can see there's, there's tracks. One's the video track. but you know, it really lets me, um, you know, you know, dissect every piece of the file so that I can see what everything correlates to in the specification. Uh, so this works with a variety of formats like EVI, Matroska, QuickTime. You know, because this is based on Media Info's libraries, even though Media Conch is kind of intended to focus on Matroska and FFV1, we can have these reporting features, um, you know, relevant to a wide variety of audiovisual formats. Um, yeah. So that's those two. Now I'm going to jump over to the implementation checker. Um, let's see, I think I have some bad files here. Working group effort, like we're always trying to make bad files because <clears throat> they show various issues. So the first column here is kind of showing valid, not valid according to the specification. Uh, if you click on that, you get uh, you get this report of all the tests that were run on the file and what their status is. So I can see here there's a test called, um, you know, document version coherency. So it's complaining because the document, it has a document ty type read version of five, uh, but that's greater than the document type version. So, I mean, this is basically saying, like, um, the tool that wrote this is writing version four, but it's requiring version five of the tool to read it, which is, uh, kind of nonsense uh, in this case. Um, so it reports it as a as an error here. Um, it has ver ver verbosity adjustments, and also you can change the format. So you can see raw XML. You can see the HTML version. If you need like an emoji-based uh, text report, you can use the Unicode version if you need emojis. Um, yeah, so that, uh, let me pick one of our yeah, this one's not valid because it doesn't contain all the mandates. Um, I mean, just like in XML, you can say that a certain element is mandatory or, you know, it has a min occurs or a max occurs. The same is, is true in eBML. Um, so this is complaining that a certain element, like the info element, must be a child of segment, but it's not present. So it's, it's making a complaint about that. I mean, realistically, I can say that um, a lot of the Matroska files that I bump into are made from FFmpeg. Um, which generally is a very high quality uh, Matroska writer. So when I test the files that I work with, they're generally all valid. But there's uh, several dozen um, Matroska writers out there, um, and some of them are not so good at all, um, you know, and just have different flaws or problems with them. Um, fortunately, in the Matroska uh, document, there's a, um, it's not here. let me go back to Media Trace. If I go into Media Trace in the info element, um, Matroska has these uh, fields called muxing app and writing app, which says who made the Matroska file, like the, the identity of the software. So using this, we've been able to like kind of identify like what the bad Matroska writers are, because uh, we can correlate the errors back to the software that wrote them. All right, and so the last thing I want to get into is policies. Um, 
at the beginning of the chat, I posted a link to a blog I wrote recently about policy updates. Um, so whereas the implementation checker is just telling you if a file is valid or not to the specification, uh, policies is where you would define your own expectations as to what characteristics a file should adhere to. Um, so in here, you have a, like when you download this, you'll have a list of like pre-made policies already. Um, and this is kind of like nested uh, conditional logic. Let's close that one. So like there's a, um, there's a document from um, Memoria called Video File Recommendations, which divides um, these kind of recommendations into recommended or conditionally recommended. So I made a test to say like, is it, uh, you know, one or the other? It's, so the, the policies, it can have like an and or or type. Um, so here I'm saying like, it has to be either recommended video encoding or conditionally recommended video encoding. Um, but those themselves are and or types. So conditionally means it's either DV or MPEG-2 or JPEG-2 or F51. So um, if I take this test and I go back to my checker, they want to run a policy, the one I picked, check files. <clears throat> so I can see like for conditionally recommended, there's only one, like this passes as format as DV, and then it usually fails the rest. But the policy is true because it's an or type of policy, so only one option has to be true for it to come from. Um, let me just go back and show another policy. Um, this, this digitization policy is like trying to emulate, um, you know, working with a vendor where you say, might say the video has to be the certain codec, a certain aspect ratio, a certain frame rate. Um, so you would put all these characteristics in there, and then when you uh, go to the checker, if you drag all your videos in, you can run the policy against the full set and see if they comply or not, and then see the reason for why they might not, not comply. Um, you can also kind of like drag and drop um, parts of policies into another. So like this is a policy to say, is it NTSC or PAL? And um, that's determined by a, bit, by a combination of frame rate, frame width, and frame um, height. So if it matches all three characteristics, uh, you know, then it would be confirmed to be PAL or NTSC depending. And, um, and you know, so you could take this whole policy and drag it as a subcomponent of another policy. If it, you know, so you can use other policies to like integrate into a, like a master one if you need to make it more complex. Um, I can say at the beginning when we set up this policy thing, there was no relation between the tests, so it would just be like a list of saying I want the height to be 480, the width to be 720. Like it would just be like a list of this equals that. Um, but then when we tried to look around for real um, policies, we can we found that most of them were more complex than that. It would say, you know, this has to equal this and this, or this has to equal that and that. Um, so like we added this kind of like nesting where we can we can like group rules to say either these are all true or one of them is true, and then you know continue the nesting. Um, can I go back over here a second? Um, so when you're in the policy viewer, I mean, I can switch to different types of policies, and it's the same display option as the implementation checker, where you can change it from text to HTML or XML, depending on what you need. You know, so I can see, you know, this random file fails a bunch of my expectations, uh, but matches some, some of them. I mean, this would really help a lot with trying to find outliers, like when you're doing a large-scale digitization project and you expect everything to be fairly controlled. Um, but then you have like a couple of flukes once in a while that fall outside um, those expectations. Yeah, so that's um, that's MediaCon so far. Uh, all our work is in GitHub. Um, we like feedback a lot. Uh, we'd be happy that if you um, think that this might be relevant to your work and you need help or advice writing a policy, um, we're really looking for more examples of policies that we can integrate into um, the application as a demonstration. Um, like currently, currently we have like five or six policies in there already. Um, but if you have like a local policy that you want support helping to write or would like to contribute back in, we'd be happy to talk to you and help support or help draft that uh, for you. Yeah, so, um, and then I guess to kind of segue back to Sarah, when we originally did this proposal, um, 
we noted that something Performa was really looking for was to make sure that they were making applications that were well capable of being integrated into larger preservation environments. So, um, you know, so, so instead of just making an application, just saying like, yeah, for sure, like you should be able to do that. We wanted to actually like include the proof of concept. So we kind of partnered with Archivematica, um, you know, and sponsored to them to help do like the initial integration work um, so that, you know, the feedback coming from that integration work could come back to us and like we could, you know, work more collaboratively and have more, you know, expertise looking at, at all this. Yeah. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, happy to hear it. If you just want to share emojis in the chat, I like that too. Um, thanks for coming to the webinar. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, so now that Dave is finished sharing his screen, I'm going to try to share mine. Oh. Hmm. Dave, you've turned off your screen, right? think so. Oh. Okay. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. uh, it's not giving me the option yet to share mine for so. Oh, there we go. Okay. This will just take a second. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay, so uh, great, you can see it. You should be seeing uh, an Archivematica screen now. So um, as Dave mentioned, um, we are really grateful for this, that they made it part of their project, part of their funding, um, to uh, investigate the integration of, of media conch into a digital preservation environment right away. So we're really happy to be that environment. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is sort of uh, development so far, and I'll describe some things that um, aren't quite working yet, but uh, we suspect will in the future. And then uh, at the end, we can kind of talk about some future possibilities as well. Um, so the version of Archivematica that you're looking at here, um, this is a branch on GitHub. So if you wanted to uh, check it out for yourselves. You can definitely do that. It's uh, in terms of where it is in terms of Archivematica's development is it's kind of somewhere in between 1.5 and 1.6. So uh, because the development started like in between those development uh, cycles. So um, you might see if you're if you're already an Archivematica user, there's going to be like a couple things that maybe you haven't seen before um, just generally in the interface. But um, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'll, I'm just going to be sort of glossing over those or ignoring them. <laughs> so um, we've uh, we've been working on kind of two different approaches to using MediaConch within Archivematica. One is to uh, validate the files, so that's using the implementation checker that Dave was describing. So that's validating the MKV files uh, specifically for now. Um, uh, against the specification. So using MediaConch to say, are these files valid um, in terms of the, uh, the specification? And secondly, uh, we've um, made some strides into integrating uh, policy checking as well. So you have a local policy and you want to check files against them. Um, so I'll talk about that second. So first I'm going to talk about uh, the validation aspect or the implementation checker. And uh, I'm going to start by going to preservation planning. So if you're already an Archivematica user, then uh, you know that the preservation planning tab is where we can roll all of the rules and commands for the various, um, for a lot of the digital preservation microservices that take place within Archivematica. So this is where you can and change your rules and commands for characterization or extraction of packages and so on. So I'm going down to, to validation. And um, first, on in commands, you'll see um, in this version of Archivematica, there's a, a couple of new things. So uh, previous to this point, the only validation tool that we had uh, integrated was Jove. Um, so Jove is still there because obviously still needed to uh, validate a whole slew of other formats. Um, but uh, now we have validate using MediaCrunch. So this is very exciting for expanding our validation uh, suite of tools. Um, I'll mention at this time too that we're definitely interested in exploring the other uh, tools being developed by the Performa project. So like Vera PDF, for example. Um, 
Joe will always have a, a place, I think, just because there are so many formats that it can do at least some validation on. But it seems like um, because of the encouragement of things like the Performa project, um, there's more interest in uh, format-specific validation tools. So we'll be looking to add more in the future. So this was a great just proof of concept for us. The other thing that you'll see here is um, checking a policy with MediaConch. I'll talk about that a bit later. So we'll revisit this in a little bit. So here's the command. So if you're um, particularly interested in uh, seeing how we're running the uh, the command, then you can see this here. Um, so Dave showed you MediaConch being used in uh, the MediaConch GUI. Uh, Archivematic is using it from the command line, so that's obviously uh, a possibility, and it's getting XML output that we can use in the mess files and in logs and so on. Uh, so again, back down to, to validation. If we look for rules, um, if you search for MKD, you'll see that we have uh, a variety of validation rules for uh, MKV. So um, there's the general purpose um, validation rule. Uh, this is a, a microservice that happens in the transfer tab, and I'm going to show it to you in a few minutes. We've also added validation of, um, of derivatives. So this is a new phase within Archivematica um, to show that the files that you've normalized are valid as well. So whether you've provided Archivematica with predefined access or preservation derivatives, or if you're relying on Archivematica to make those for you, then uh, you can validate those against the specification as well. And then again, there's validation of the policy, and I'm going to address that a little bit later. So I'm going to do a quick uh, demonstration. Um, it's going to kind of fly right through because it's going to use a pre-configured uh, processing file to just kind of make all of the microservice decisions as it goes. Um, so I'm going to um, browse for some material. And we have some acceptance tests that we've been working with here. Um, so maybe I'll choose the uh, not valid test. I can show you how uh, things, um, if, if your files are not uh, valid, how that will appear. So I'm just going to give my transfer name, not valid demo, and start the transfer. This transfer browser is, is new, and you'll see this um, uh, in the 1.6 release when we get to that. So uh, after I approve my transfer, it's going to start running through its microservices. And uh, it's a pretty small uh, transfer, so very shortly get to the validation stage, which, as I mentioned, happens in transfer. So um, obviously, the formats have to be identified first. So uh, we can see that these formats, uh, these files have been identified as, uh, or it's just one file, actually, as a generic MKV. And here we see that our validation failed. So if we look at the tool output, we can see that um, uh, MediaConch implementation check failed for the following check, and it failed because it's not actually an FFV1. So this is a failure that you'll see sometimes with MKVs, um, and this is just an example of that. So at this point, if you're if this were uh, you know if this were your content and you were um, processing it, then you know you kind of have a decision to make whether you want to carry forward. Uh, with the rest of your preservation tasks, or if you want to do some work outside of the system and, and address these issues, or maybe it's just enough for you to know these files aren't valid and you want that to be recorded. So if you can continue this uh, transfer, which it will have continued uh, in the ingest tab, um, we can see here uh, that it's gone ahead and it's already at the store ape um, stage. So if we review it, you can take a look at the, oh, you can see we have a lot of things sitting here. Uh, there's my demo, not valid demo. If we take a look at the METS file, um, then uh, you'll see that uh, there will be an event for validation. Somewhere along the way. 
here we go. So here it's giving us the output and telling us that we use MediaConch and this is the version that we used. We're using a slightly outdated version at this point. Uh, we haven't quite caught up to uh, the folks at Media Area. Um, but we see that the, the premise outcome is fail and it gives an event detail note explaining why it failed. Um, we're, we haven't yet implemented this, but we're considering taking the full output from MediaConch because uh, this is obviously <laughs> Um, uh, you know, a really concatenated um, uh, version of, of what you'd get out of uh, MediaConch. So we're considering writing the entirety of it to a log, not adding it to the METS file because our METS files are frankly already big enough. <laughs> um, so we think that maybe adding it to a log instead in the AIP, which would be like a relatively small like text or XML file or something, so it's not going to have a major uh, storage impact for you, but uh, it might be useful information for you to have. So that's something that, that we're working on. So uh, that is um, validating the um, the original files. I mentioned also that um, we, we are uh, doing validation of uh, the derivatives as well. So here we have, um, this is a, uh, just a demo I ran through earlier, where it's uh, normalized and uh, should have um, determined that the normalized copies were uh, valid. So here, there's a, a, a within the normalization microservice, there's a new job. So this is something that you wouldn't have seen before if you look very closely at your <laughs> archive Matica jobs. Uh, validate preservation derivatives is a new job within the, the normalized microservice. So again, you can see the output here if you want. So you can see, um, for starters, there's files in the, it'll, uh, if it's not a preservation derivative, then it's not validating it at this point. Um, but things that are a preservation derivative are being validated. Um, we're currently in this, uh, in, in our development so far, we are validating preservation derivatives, but we'll certainly uh, be adding access derivatives as well. So if you're making FFV1 or, or MKV for access purposes, I don't know if that's a common use case, but we figure for validating preservation derivatives, we may as well validate access derivatives too. So that'll that'll come up in the future. Um, if you want an easier to view um, look at what happened there, um, we've added the validation to the normalization report. So some of you may use this report already to make sure that your normalization is uh, going okay. So here you can see that this transfer started with a in, um, an MOV file and an uh, MP4 file, and you can see that uh, the, the preservation uh, normalization happened uh, and it succeeded, but also there's this new column here, preservation conformance check. So it's checking for, uh, it's using the, the media conch implementation checker to say, are the preservation derivatives that we created um, valid to the specification? So again, you can click on pass to see the output if you want and it'll also be in the METS file. Um, so you can see we've kind of laid the groundwork here for the access uh, check as well, but it just hasn't been implemented just yet. So those are the validation um, aspects of, um, of using MediaConch within Archivematica. Uh, so I'll also um, discuss a little bit about what we've been doing with the policy checking. So uh, for starters, uh, you uh, would need to provide Archivematica with a policy that you want to it to check against. So Dave was showing you in the GUI some of the policies that you can kind of explore and use as models there. You can also use the MediaConch GUI to create your own policy, and then you can export it. And uh, in the administration tab, there's a new area for policies. And uh, you can just ignore this uh, dot keep file that shouldn't be there, uh, but from the MiaConch GUI, uh, you'd be able to um, export an XSL file, which you can then upload to Archivematica, and then it's, uh, you know, available to Archivematica to use. So it's not going to automatically use this policy to check anything unless you've also made a validation uh, rule in preservation planning. So again, back in preservation planning, under the heading of validation, uh, when we search for MKV, we saw this, uh, this rule for validating uh, preservation derivatives against this policy, and the command is check against this specific policy. So I'll show you just what that command looks like for those who are interested. Um, 
So if you wanted to upload multiple policies to have them check against like different kinds of uh, files to use in different sorts of situations, you can you could do that and you could enable or disable commands. It's all based in like everything in Archivematica in terms of preservation planning. It's very much based around the format. So um, back to the rule that we were just at. Um, this is a, uh, a rule for validation that's going to apply only to generic MKB files, things that are identified as that. Um, so uh, currently, we're validating preservation derivatives, but we're interested in your feedback, actually, on whether or not you would also want to use a policy for original files. Um, so not things that are derivatives that either you've provided through a, like a manual normalization workflow um, or um, things that, um, uh, or just like original files, if you have a, a use for using policies for that. And Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but you could, you could actually use MediaClench to make policies for other types of file formats, is that right? Yeah, for sure, he says in chat. <laughs> so um, you might have, uh, you know, you might have vendor supplied MOV files or something and you want to check them against a policy and you're putting them through um, Archivematica for preservation purposes. You should be able to create a policy using um, Media Conch, um, put it into Archivematica by uploading it to the administration tab and making yourself a, a command and a rule. And I think when we release this to the, um, like when it becomes part of an Archivematica release, we'll make sure we include an example so that you see kind of how it works. Um, and then it'll just be like the example one, you may want to disable it because it you know, obviously won't be relevant to you, but at least you'll be able to see a model of how, how it works. So again, back in the transfer tab, if I wanted to, um, to do this, we have some uh, examples that we can use to test against our policy. So um, here are all conform policies, so I'll do that one. So I'll just call it conforms to policy demo and start that transfer and it'll run through uh, quite quickly. So, uh, like I say, there's nothing in the transfer microservices yet that would check against the policy. It's going to wait until it uh, does the normalization, and then it will um, it will check the the normalized derivatives to see if they conform to the policy. But, like I say, I'm interested to know from all of you whether it should also be checking somewhere in the transfer tab to create a new microservice. One thing. Um, just an explanatory thing about how this is being managed in the preservation planning tab and uh, the reason why it all falls under the heading of validation, whether it's um, whether it's validation in relation to a policy or validation in relation to a standard. We actually tried to pitch to the premise editorial committee that we really wanted to add a new thing called verification <laughs> to the, the premise events vocabulary. And we kept trying to make the argument that validating something against a, a published specification and verifying whether it conforms to your local policy are two kind of distinct things, but they didn't agree. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, uh, we're calling it all validation, but we've distinguished them within the, um, within the MET file so that you know what kind of validation you're talking about. Uh, so again, within the, the um, or sorry, not within normalize, after normalize. So there's this new uh, microservice, policy checks for derivatives, um, and uh, it says that it's completed successfully. So we should see some output here um, for here's the, like one of the files that it runs against. So you can see the output there. And in the MET file for this one, um, there's my demo. And I'm just going to search for MediaConch to save myself a little time. So there's the implementation check. So that's fine. Um, but here's the validation check. So um, we've 
uh, in the event outcome, we've specified that it's a policy check as opposed to an implementation check, which was the previous one. So uh, an event outcome for an implementation check will say media conch implementation check. For a policy check, it will say media conch policy check, just so that you have. And you can see that there's a little bit more detail there. So it's saying specifically, like, what were the aspects of the policy that it met in order to say that this, um, that this meets the policy. So I think that's everything that I have to show you um, from, uh, from what we've done so far. Um, so I think it's maybe a good time to uh, pass it over for questions. Natalie, did you have anything you want to add or guide us or anything? Sure, I'm going to make chat a little bit bigger. Uh, yeah, good idea. Yeah, you you figured out how to do that? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Nice. Um, yeah, if anyone had any questions right now, unfortunately we can't uh, enable audio for everyone just for like, you know, sanity's sake, but it'd be great if you wanted to add them here. And then I wanted to encourage you guys to reach out um, or let me know if it's okay if we reach out to you to talk more about your specific use cases as we're developing so we can learn your needs and also kind of see how this is going in the wild and other in other ways. So yeah, if anyone has questions, let us know. And if anyone wants us to reach out to them, like give me a thumbs up or something and uh, and we can get your info from Sarah. Okay, dead silence. <laughs> um, <laughs> other than that, just thank you so much for joining. And I guess that's Maybe. it, yeah? Well, while people are thinking of their questions, because I'm sure somebody must have a question, <laughs> um, something that uh, we've been talking about um, with uh, Dave and everyone at Media Area is uh, the idea of um, making a policy that is based on the original file that you have. So if you normalize a file within Archivematica, there's certain characteristics that maybe you want to say that file should continue to have. So um, it should come out to be the same duration, for example, or it should come out to be the same um, aspect ratio or something like that. So um, that might be a future development piece. I don't know, Dave, if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, comparison policies, as Dave says, is what those will be called. So I think that's, like, personally, I think that's of really high interest to the Archivematica community. Um, but uh, obviously, we'd be interested to hear from all of you on, on your thoughts on that. And I should have said earlier in the... Um, in our uh, webinar, I, I uh, suspect and I know that most or all of you are like already pretty familiar with Archivematica, at least have given it a spin. But if you're not at all familiar, this was all like, wow, super confusing. I don't understand what's going on. What's the preservation planning tab? What's all this stuff? Um, we have other webinars on our YouTube channel. So uh, that's an easy way, like if this kind of whetted your appetite and you want to um, take a I look at other uh, more general Archivematica resources, they're definitely out there and feel free to contact me if you can't find them. So no questions at all? Dave asked if there are MKV files that are generic, and I don't think so. I think that's just what uh, that's like what they're called in Pronom, maybe. And that's why they're called that in Archivematica. You would know better than I if <laughs> if there's such a thing as an MKV that's uh, something other than generic. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? And also, of course, you can follow up. I put our email address up there, too, because um, sometimes it takes a while for this to sink in. Or when you download it, you might come across questions that you wouldn't otherwise think about. Yeah, definitely. I know I've had a lot of questions along the way. <laughs> and everyone at Media Area has answered them very kindly. <laughs> 
awesome use case. So. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I someone take my name. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it just like misspelled it for me. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. Well, awesome. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty excited about it. Cool. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off the uh, audio. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and being in touch. Yeah, thanks very much. As Dave just mentioned, um, I'll be at EMEA just with a poster, not a formal presentation or anything. Uh, and Dave will be there as well. And uh, we'd love to connect with you there if you want to chit chat. Yeah, please. I think Dave and I were talking about doing like a little UX feedback like hour with folks who want to share their experiences. So I will be available for that. We haven't figured out a time. That's a great um, idea. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much for coordinating Thanks our so Oh, it's my pleasure. Awesome. We'll see you at Amia, Brian, and Eddie. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.